Hello everyone, my name is Loco, and welcome back to another high-level match of StarCraft 2. Now what I've got for you today is supposed to be a banger of a game. We find ourselves on the map side Delta, we're in the top left-hand corner, we're looking inside of the main base of Gumiho, and his opponent in the opposite corner with the blue Terran pieces, he goes by the name of Cure. Some of the very best Terran players in the world, alright, and now... Now, word on the StarCraft Street has it that apparently in this game we're gonna get copious amounts of battlecruisers. Now, I'm, I'm personally a big fan of the Battle Cruiser. I mean, I guess any science fiction nerd, aka anybody who watches my videos. Sorry, didn't mean to insult you by calling you a nerd, but uh, you're, you're watching other people play video games. That's, that's pretty nerdy behavior. But anyways, most people that are fans of science fiction will be big fans as well of big capital Terran ships. And it's been a while. Honestly, we don't really see that much, yeah, Battle Cruiser play in general, especially in TVT. I don't know, maybe early game cheeses, and that's pretty uncommon too, but in the late game it's difficult to transition into. Your opponent can just make Vikings and Ravens, and since they take a long time to produce, and since they are very expensive, I'm curious to see how we're gonna see them getting mixed in. Now that being said, Gumiho is apparently starting off this particular game with a bit of a bang, and he's definitely also, I don't know who ends up making better cruisers. It could be the both of them, but if I were to be a betting man, I would say that Gumiho is certainly the most likely candidate to go for some battle cruiser play because he is not afraid to mix it up and play something a little bit more spicy. Generally speaking, Cure, he's known as the People's Terran. He's very good at playing quote-unquote normal StarCraft 2, but he's amongst the very best players in the game. I'm a big fan of Cure, even though I feel like he sometimes gets overshadowed a little bit by, well, other quote-unquote standard players, like maybe, for example, a Clem or, for example, a Maru, and then when it comes to, like, really fancy control, I guess, again, we have Clem, but also somebody like Bjorn, and then when it comes to, like, the spicy build orders, usually Gumiho is a name that comes up a lot, but, yeah, Cure really, amongst the very best in the world, he's won his fair share of tournaments, yet I feel like he doesn't really get the same level of respect that some other players out there do get. Anyways, maybe if I keep repeating that often enough, at some point, people will, you know, <laughs> start talking about Cure. Like he is an absolute legend as well, because he is. Anyways, Gumiho is starting up with a little bit of double Reaper shenanigans. With one of those barracks on the other side of the map, he's going to be able to pump out units very rapidly. Interestingly enough, okay, I think this is the first time that he properly sees what he's playing against. Interestingly enough, there is no real... Well, is it a Reaper for a Reaper? I guess that's okay. <laughs> There's no wall off. I mean, the Reapers obviously can just go up to the high ground that way, but I think even Gumiho assumed that there would be a structure there blocking his pathing. The main advantage right here, though, for Cure is that he did get himself that nice second gas going. He's also dealing some damage on the other side of the map, it looks like, and ultimately, it's a bit of a wash right here in the early game, right? So both players end up losing, well, an SCV or two and then two Reapers. Ultimately, though, I do like this start a little bit better here for Cure because he's got a small time advantage. Whereas on the other side of the map, we're only just now going into a factory. We already see that starport coming up right here for Cure. On the flip side though, Gumiho is probably about eh, 20, maybe 10 seconds earlier on the command center here on the low ground. But he's now going to be forced into a defensive posture. Luckily for him, that bunker here will be quite neat, especially once it's done. Currently it's not yet available, so okay, we're going to trade out units once more. We're going to try and body block that Reaper. Jimmy over here will finish the job, but this is working out really lovely here for Cure in the end. Slowing, that, uh, slowing down that command center in any way, shape, or form is massive. Yeah, so you ultimately delay the time at which that command center finishes, and therefore the orbital command, and therefore the amount of mules that Gumiho is going to be able to use throughout this game. And that's one of the downsides of proxying a barracks. Your unit production is just simply not quite up to par compared to the opponent's. Now, of course, ultimately, reinforcing units will pop out, and ultimately that command center will finish up, which it just now did. But this is certainly a good start right here for Cure. Cure immediately fires up a third command center as well. I kind of like that, so he built the third CC on location, whereas the, well, the natural expansion was built inside of the main base. Not really something you normally see, right, in TVT? Or in StarCraft 2 in general, the Terrans have a, a third base taken, but not yet the, the natural expansion. Anyways, it works out properly right here for Cure. We do have a little bit of a tech transition right now. So, Gumiho transitioning towards a couple of those Cyclones. The Cyclone, of course, has gone through a lot of changes. I don't think it's really much better in TVT overall, but 
yeah, it's definitely a unit that's a nice stepping stone if you are a little bit concerned. And then right next to that factory production, we also have a starport now researching well, the ability for the uh, Raven to be able to temporarily shut down opposing units. So in the past, before the new multiplayer balance patch, the Raven would spawn with the ability to use interference matrix. But nowadays, that is no longer the case. It's a short little upgrade. It's not particularly expensive, but it helps out in Terran versus Protoss quite a bit. Okay. Cure in the meantime, going into the siege tank production and not actually following this up with any additional upgrades here. We'll have to see exactly what his plan is, because we don't have a second barracks yet, and we don't have a tech lab on the barracks. Instead, he decides to rush out the Hyperflight Eroders upgrade, which is another one of those things. Ah, okay, we're gonna go into a second factory. So, he's gonna be playing Terran Mech here. Anyways, Hyperflight Rotors, it's the Benchy Speed Improvement. Pretty cheap upgrade these days. I mean, it didn't get buffed with the most recent patch, but it did get buffed, I think, the patch or two before that one. Anyways, it doesn't really matter all too much, but it's a, a relatively cheap upgrade that really does have a lot of potential because those benchies, they can certainly pack a punch. Now, two of them are already done. We're going to be sending them across the map. A raven, is it already out? Yeah, there should be a raven available. I mean, it doesn't matter though. Nah, the benchy damage output is too big. Okay. Even with an interference matrix, there's even a second benchy here, or sorry, a second raven now out. That lock-on, though, is apparently at about the same speed as the Banshee itself. So, ultimately, one of those Cyclones does finish the job, and Cure is gonna be pushed back. I don't really like him diving that deep if he plans on going for Hyperflight Rotors. I think he should try and preserve those Banshees for a little bit longer. But what are the odds right now that Gumiho is expecting... Well, he scans here. Okay, lovely scan. I was gonna say, what are the odds that he expects that there will be additional Banshee play after the, well, first group of them. So he now scans that it's additional factories here. So he now knows that he's up against Terran Mech, but he also saw the green light right over there in the tech lab. I guess one of the downsides for Terran in the new patch is that that could also be for Raven production. So there's a chance right here that Gubiho does not realize that this is going to be for Benshee speed, but in the past, that was really the only proper other, yeah, option there other than the cloaking upgrade. He already saw the cloaking upgrade being done. But anyways, Gumiho is gonna have to prepare himself either way, and it doesn't really matter all too much. He's firing up missile turrets. Yeah, he has successfully deduced what he is playing against. He needs some defense here, because these Benchies, they are quick. Okay. Yeah, you can't really commit. Nah, it's very tricky. Lovely play right here. So, one Benchie apparently gets beaten in a one-on-one -on -one fight with a Cyclone. And if you have a Raven in the mix with Interference Matrix, it makes it pretty easy to actually finish off two of those benchies. So, the perfect counter right over here. A Raven together with a Cyclone. Apparently, that's the perfect counter against two speed cloaked benchies. In the meantime, though, at home, maybe the benchies haven't really achieved that much, but Cure is transitioning towards double upgrades. The downside of playing Terran Mech is that it's slow, right? So, generally speaking, this is one of those unit compositions that doesn't really move across the map until. Uh, you get a really large force going. Obviously, there's small little hit squads that you can sort of send out. I mean, the Benchies are harassing and all that, but this is a slow and immobile unit comp. It's usually up to the Bio Terran, which happens to be what Gumiho is playing here. Yeah, it's usually up to the Bio Terran to start up the real action. Gumiho is going to have a much easier time expanding around the map. Cure is probably going to play a lot more, yeah, a lot more passively here for now, and Taking that fourth command center that he just now started up, he probably wants to establish it over here, can become very difficult for him. So, in a way, this is almost a little bit like Terran versus Zerg, where, well, the bio Terran is the Zerg player. He's got the much more mobile army, the much bigger economy. But ultimately, the death ball here that Cure is trying to produce, yeah, it is very scary and something that Cure needs to, or sorry, something that Gumiho here needs to respect. We have the second starport here coming up. I'm assuming we're going to be going into some Viking production as well, maybe some Liberators later on. So who here is more likely to go into Battlecruisers later? I kind of assumed, right, if you would have covered up these names, that it would have been Gumiho playing the Mech Army, because he was known as the Mech King back in the day, and that Cure, who pretty much always plays the same styles, that it would be Cure to play the Bio-based army here instead. I feel like transitioning towards Battlecruisers is a little... But I guess Gumiho's income will be bigger? Yeah, a little hard to say. Anyways, 
We have Thors coming up right now here, for cure. One thing to note in this particular matchup is that Vikings are usually very important, because once you do get that Viking and air superiority, you can start, well, thinking about making Liberators, and Liberators are really good when it comes to forcing the opponent to on siege. Obviously, there are some missile turrets here in the front, but mostly when the opponent decides to get aggressive, when you do have that Liberator ranged upgrade, you can really shut down those ground units of the mecking player quite easily, but... It obviously requires a lot of units, right? And we already have Kyr now pumping out four of those Vikings at once as well. And he's already brought Big Daddy Thor out onto the battlefield as well. A little bit of a bio push over here. Yeah, that's just not enough units here for the player in red to prevent that fourth CC from coming up. But in the meantime at home, he's already building up his own planetary fortress hat. There's a fifth command center happening just north of the third. And Gumiho is happily just macroing up here. One thing you have to be careful of, though, if you are Gumiho in this scenario, is that Cure is not going to be able to just go for that sledgehammer push, right? So we see it all the time. Ooh, would you look at that? We have ourselves the fusion core. I would imagine this is for Liberator ranged, but with two starports coming down, it could definitely be for Battlecruiser player here already. Anyways, you got to be careful because Cure doesn't show any signs of wanting to move out just yet, but he's only a minute or two away from being maxed out, currently at 166 supply. He may wait until all of his upgrades are done too. I mean, he did fire up the plus one air weapons upgrade here just now as well. There's a chance that there is enough time for Gumi to go into battlecruisers right now, but it is a little bit risky because this is the type of army, yeah, that can just march straight through the center of the map and demolish everything in its path. Scans over here though for Gumiho do review exactly what's going on. We had a command center building here as well in the bottom left hand corner. The bio army is moving forward. Gumiho right now, for all intents and purposes, maxed out. Fires up the plus three research. Are we going? Oh, we are going tech labs. Okay. So, second armory coming up as well. I think Gumiho wants to lose some of his units and then maybe trade them out for battle cruisers here already instead. A lot of the siege tanks here caught completely on siege. Cure not responding in time against this massive bio ball. That being said, though, the Viking count here is looking, well, very dangerous, but. That fight went way better right there for Gumiho than it really should have been because Cure was just not sieged up in time. Okay, now he can even start thinking about taking care of this planetary fortress. Although it is a little bit risky to get into the right, uh, the, the right position over here. Okay, we're just gonna go for Ravens, guys. A little bit boring, I know, but Ravens are the more conventional choice. There's the plus one air weapons, though. On the production tab, Gumiho is still building up his eco. Currently up to 88 workers here, versus only 73 for Cure. And now the siege tanks in red are in range of the planetary. Keep in mind that planetary fortresses cannot be lifted up. Orbital commands can fly, regular command centers can fly, but once you build a planetary fortress, that structure cannot take off. And well, That's a little caveat right there that did not go in favor of Cure. Tried to use it as a defensive measure, did not quite end up happening that way. We had a missile turret built here, apparently, on location to try and block a potential fifth. It's now going to be, I guess, the second fourth, which is not quite optimal. Yeah, he will be able to secure another base here and cure. I mean, he is getting to a point where he is looking very powerful once again with his army. But obviously, that first fight that we just saw between those, yeah, really large armies, you can tell it right here in the minerals and gas lost. That was not good whatsoever there for our player in blue. One thing I also don't really like right here for Cure is that he's not continuously upgrading. Upgrades are so important in these sorts of scenarios, and the fact that Cure, yeah, it's just, I guess he may be a little bit concerned, but he had the money for it to, to restart it already. Maybe he wants to max out first before, yeah, so that's what he does. Before dedicating himself to upgrades once more, it's not like he's forgetting about it. He's just concerned that Gumiho is gonna come in for the killer move here in just a moment. Additional starports coming up in the main base once again of Gumi. So that is going to be a grand total of... Where are they? Ah, we're going to go up to seven starports. I don't think all of them have tech labs on them. Nah, there's two of them here with reactors. So that's going to be for that Viking production. Um, a battle cruiser is 400 minerals and 300 gas each. It's stupid expensive. So seven... <laughs> Seven starports is a bit extreme. But anyways, we can see how this goes. I mean, Gumiho moving in once again. Okay. This is an orbital command right now, which, yeah, can fly, but doesn't have any defensive capabilities. And now a lot of the 
siege tanks end up going down as well. Gumiho showing us the reason as to why Terran mech is not quite as popular anymore as it once used to be. Against a more mobile army like the one that Gumi is playing, look at him, he's just taking every expansion like he's a Zerk. It really is very reminiscent of like Zerk versus Terran mech, right? Zerk just gobbles up the entire map, gets way more income, and then over time they can just outgrow the player who plays that more passive army. Now, there have been moments where Kira is caught up worker-wise, or income-wise at the very least, but I think that's mostly because of the fact that he had those mules. Every time he uh, yeah, remembers he has some energy available in those orbital commands, he can drop down some mules and get a stupid amount of income. Now, here we go. Okay. Battle cruisers coming up very, very soon. We have the Yamato cannon research right now as well. Four BCs all at once on the production tab. And I actually like the timing of this quite a bit, even though it's still risky. At least at this point, Gumiho's economy is significant, so he can actually sort of make this choice. But he also likely has enough time to actually get the units out, because it happens all the time that players are trying to get BCs going, and yeah, the opponent just moves across the map, and by the time that the first BC is out, the fights have already ended. It's just such a tricky unit to transition into, but Cure clearly is just trying to defend his own bases at home right now. He's not really... Well, I mean, he's thinking about going for an attack right now, but this is not a fast-moving army, you know? It's not something that is gonna... Yeah, hinder Gumiho all too much. It's not like he's gonna accidentally be caught at, like, technically 200-200 supply, but realistically more like... Ooh, he's actually trying to buy some time here as well with some of those siege tanks. So, yeah, you pay for the supply count as soon as you start up the unit, and sometimes you think you're maxed out, but you still actually have, like, 17 units on the production tab, and you're kind of missing out on, like, 30 supply worth of stuff. This little move right here from Gumiho, it's a siege tank sacrifice. Maybe some question marks here for Cure. What is Gumiho cooking up this time around, but... Ultimately, this siege tank move here has bought a ton of time right now for Gumiho to really get the battle cruisers operational. So there they are. The Viking count is also now growing. We're up to 23. More and more are popping out. Yamato gun has been researched here as well. The weapon refit here for those BCs. That being said, though, the Viking count here for Cure is massive. Yeah, he's got one more upgrade as well on his flying units, which is not to be underestimated. But this is the first time right here that Mr. Cure is gonna see the Battle Cruiser transition. Are there enough Vikings right now though for Gumi? He does have Ravens in the mix, anti-armor missile, and even like the auto turrets. And if you want to, even, well, the, the interference matrix against the opponent's Vikings, it would work. It is pretty neat. Now a couple Yamato guns over there do complete. Planetary Fortress gets shut down and the BCs are once again back home here for at least a little bit. Obviously those two abilities are gonna be on cooldown right now, but he's gonna be able to use them again in just a moment. Kira knows this though, so he decides to go straight across the map. Anti-armor missiles right there going down. That actually makes this fight a whole lot more risky here for Kira. Yes, he does have the numbers. He does simply have more units. We do have a couple of Widow Mines now underneath as well, but those auto turrets and the interference matrixes and the anti-armor missile, I mean, all of it combined is so incredibly useful. We don't mind, though! Nice trap right there by Cure, but the Vikings are not taking uh, all that beating. Instead, it's going to be the Battlecruiser here who was forced to soak up some of those Widow Mine hits. And ultimately, right now, Gumiho is the one who ends up with a larger Terran flying force. So, Sky Terran here, going strong. We have five additional Battle Cruisers on the production tab. This time around, it does feel a little bit more risky, because, yeah, I mean, technically, here's what I'm talking about. 200, 200 supply here for Gumi, or 198. There we go, back up to 200. But realistically, that is so much supply caught up in units that are not yet done. I really like what Kira is doing here with the Widow Mines. Realizing what his opponent is doing, you, know, you realize that the opponent is trying to be a tricky boy. Decides to be a tricky boy himself as well. Does Widow Mines with their reburrowing speed, obviously, very, very powerful in these scenarios. And against clumped up Vikings, they're not to be underestimated. So, what Gumiho decides to do is land all of those units on the ground. They deal bonus damage against mechanicals. So, technically speaking, Widow Mines, I mean, not that big of a trouble. Yeah, I think ultimately there's just too much stuff right here for Gumi. Battle Cruisers are once again ready to pop out of all of those starports. That was quite a few workers going down. But Kyra doesn't have that big of an economy here himself in the end. He now scans and he sees that there are planetary fortresses built all over the map. 
essentially every base right now, other than this one over here, has been taken, and Gumiho is gobbled up like 80% of the bases, at least that's what it feels like. Five battle cruiser route, four more on the production tab as well, plus three air weapons is going to start up here, but it just finished here for Cure. Cure at this moment is not really able to produce as many Vikings all at once. So even though he does have the plus three air weapons done, it might honestly be time to just go into full Widow Mine and Thor production here instead. Ah, not quite what you're looking for when you just max out your air weapon upgrades, but it's just difficult for him to really, yeah, match that economy of the opponent and get enough production going here. Okay, once again, the battle cruisers are back in action. Four more. I mean, about 80% of the way done. They can obviously reinforce this army very easily if they do decide to use their technical jump ability offensively. Usually we see it being used defensively, but it certainly is a choice. The only mining base that we... Well, or the only not mining base, I guess, is the one right now that Cure is trying to secure. Massive win on my detonation right over there. A lot of the Viking did take the beating there, and that was all things considered so much better there for Cure. I actually thought Gumiho was gonna wipe the floor with that army. Battle cruisers at this point are out once again. Here's that command center that I was talking about. Cure is still pretty much broke though. BCs find this base, immediately use their technical jump, and Cure is running out of steam. Yeah, this is the only base that's really mining. He decides to tap out, he realizes that there's no way he's gonna be able to match the economy. It may seem a little bit funny that Cure decides to tap out, despite the fact that he's at 151 supply. But honestly, with the amount of income that Gumiho here has, and the amount of money still in the bank, there really isn't a way for Cure to properly get back in the game. I think he would need another, like, three of those engagements with his Widow Mines. So ultimately, it's the Gumi God who obtains the victory.